Okay, folks, so we are still busy with problematic thinking errors. There's quite a number of them to go through. And today we're going to look at thinking error number 11. And it's called no perseverance and risk taking and corrosion and cutoff. Now, these things are related. That's why we put them in, in groups together. No perseverance means a failure to make an effort or to endure adversity. Adversity is resistance. Ad adversity is when you are planning to achieve something and there seems to be obstacles in your way all the time. And that means that you give up. And nobody has really become very successful in life that has been a giver-upper. It's when the going gets tough that the tough get going to sell it on a gym. Yeah. So when you need to achieve something in life and there's a lot of obstacles and normally the higher the value of the thing that you need to achieve in life, the more resistance you get. I mean the guy that produced the electric bulb, he had to do over a thousand experiments before he eventually got the combination of oxygen and the element and the electrical current and everything right to produce the first globe that burnt for a little while. But look, the value that it added to our lives globally, so to speak. You follow? Not yet globes, what else? What else? Any globe, but your globes. But this guy had to persevere. Now, my question is, how many of you in this room would have been prepared to go through that process of elimination to eventually get something to just shed a little bit of light in your life. You see what I'm saying? So the higher the value, the higher the value, the more the resistance. And so it's those guys that really achieve great things in life that have perseverance. I can show a black person in a work school what he learned from the word school was full heart, persevere. And the army had us said from bite fast. But it's not the ones that all the physical tools, and medical tools, and skillful tools, and all the ontbieringen kon deerkom, wat uiteindelijk die elite soldaten geworden in die weermacht. Die mannen wat kon vast bite is die mannen wat uitgestegen het boer al die andere troepen. Okay, sure. Hello, was the special okies. Now, the criminal puts out little effort, but he may put out a lot of energy doing the things he wants to do. Instead of putting up with adversity of life, he escapes into criminal thought and actions. Adversity is anything that is not going his way, which he sees as a failure to control, and he refuses to accept it. So you get a lot of guys that give themselves over to begging. You get a lot of guys that give themselves over to breaking into people's houses. And to rob and to steal. And then you get these guys on the internet. They are so persistent in sending you a message on how they can give you this fortune from this guy. And that auntie there in the Congo. And here in the in Switzerland. And they can get all good. But they steer and they steer and they steer. They automated emails to you too. And weet jy wat, dis hulle mentaliteit. Ergens, ergens gaan daar een sakker wees, wat daarvoor gaan val. So hulle bijt vast en hulle gaan aan, en dan maak hulle geld net daar uit. So, corrective, except that there must be consequence to failure to put forth effort. Remind self of the energy one has when waiting to do something, and direct it towards responsible efforts instead. The amount of time that you spend running around trying to get the money together to go and buy your next little scafe or your next packet of this or that or whatever, take that effort and put it into something right and see what happens in your life. You spent a lot of energy trying to stay out of the cop's hands and trying to manipulate people and all sorts of other stuff. Instead of spending that time and energy on doing something constructive in your life, you would never have landed up here. Remember that everyone experiences adversity and work to find solutions instead of abandoning efforts. So, allemaal van ons gaan dier moeilike tye gaan, maak nie sak wat jy doen nie. 
Scriptural application. There are classic examples to solutions for this thinking error. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10 provides us with one of the best. The passage is about Paul the Apostle. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations. Now you'll see that as we go through the scripture, I put these words in italics. And then I give an explanation. Paul was a gifted man. He had seen Christ after the resurrection and God revealed special secrets to him. He was a special person, handpicked by God. Therefore, the possibility of his, of his becoming arrogant about all this was strong. Right. So now he says, to prevent that, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, in my human nature, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now notice, it is in his flesh that he's experiencing this adversity. But this adversity did not just come upon him. It was given to him. Nah. Satan didn't just come along and do what he wanted to do with this guy. He had to get permission from God. And there was a purpose behind it. Lest I should be exalted above measure. So God had to allow something in Paul's life. To keep him down on the level where the rest of us plebs and human beings are. Otherwise he would have thought of himself as just below the angels and far above humanity. And then he wouldn't have been able to write to us with empathy. And being able to get down to our level and preach to us sermons that we could relate to. Write letters that we could understand. But he came back down to the human level. Even Jesus did this. He was tempted in every way. Just as we were. And he certainly experienced adversity. I mean he landed up on the cross. Eventually. For this thing I besought the Lord three times. That it might depart from me. He asked God three times to deliver him from this thing that embarrassed and haunted him. God never did. And he God said to me. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul accepted the infirmities in exchange for the power of Christ. So he said, well, if that's the case, then if I have to walk in this weakness, give it to me so that Christ can be exalted. So what was his motive? Not for himself, but for Christ's glory. And as a result... He could deal with it. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Wow. That shuts the devil up, doesn't it? In reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, this is when a person comes to spiritual maturity. This is when you start realizing, it's not about my ego. It's not about what people think of me. It's not about my reputation. It's not about my good deeds. It's all about Jesus being manifested in my life. People being able to see him at work in me than them seeing me. And that's when the power of God really manifests in your life. And then tell jy nie meer so baie in jou eie oor nie. Look at that list. Infirmities, insults, hardships, persecutions, perplexities, distresses. These are the things that made him strong because they made him weak. When he was weak in human strength, he was strong and able in divine strength. So how did Paul handle it? He accepted it as being from God and he went on with his life. In 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9, Paul said, For a great door and effectual is open to me, and there are many adversaries. So he realized the moment that this door opened up in Europe, and he could go preach the gospel everywhere, he realized he was going to meet with resistance. And did he? Yes, he was beaten up, thrown in jail how many times? But even when he was in jail and Bound up against the Roman soldier. What happened? He used that whole attire of the Roman soldier, the whole circumstance that he was in to write a very powerful letter to us in Ephesians. 
So where he was in a place where he was in chains, he could hardly see properly. He wrote the most powerful letters. You follow? Because it was not Paul and Paul's circumstances that mattered. It was the message that was inside him that had to be carried out. Effectual means of great potential. He had opportunities that possessed great potential. However, there was a catch. There were enemies opposing him. Opportunities can mean the best of times and the worst of times. So when you start getting into a state where you really live by the Spirit, every single thing that you happen, see happening to you, whether it seems good or it seems bad, you see as an opportunity. You see it as a positive that's coming your way. When you get resistance, you know somewhere along the line, there is something along this track that is not quite right. So let me persevere because when I get through this, I'm going to see the right thing. And I'm seeing it. And so a hierdie plaas koopere is a honest story, pal. Ek rei my achterhend af. En ek gaan kyk. En dan maak ek een deel hier so. En dan val het deur. En dan maak ek een deel daar. En dan val het deur. En dan probeer ek een deel daar maak. Dan werk het nie. Maar ek weet, alles gebeur so. Omdat God my op precies die rechte plek wil he. Maar dat hy vir my in die proces meer inzig en weisheid gee. Om die rechte plek raak te sien. Yes. And that when he finalizes the deal and concludes the deal, it will be to the best interest of his kingdom. And that matters. In the meantime, ek moet maar net vast buiten aangaan. En ek sien dit al hoe nader kom. Ek sien die beloofde land so tree vir tree, dag vir dag, al hoe nader kom. En een van die dag is ek oor die Jordaan. En dan slat ek die regoer sy mere plat. Dan maak ek die deel. Ok, so, realize this. Opportunities can mean the best of times and the worst of times. Do not let adversity stop you. If everything you want is what God wants you to have, then God wants you to have everything you want. Wow, man, I love this. His grace is sufficient for you, just as it was for Paul. What others have done, you can do. Risk taking. Poor decision making for responsible living. He does not use sound reasoning, fact finding or consideration of cost, risk or options. He is reluctant to ask questions to learn the facts before making decisions. If his pretensions or desires are contradicted by the facts, he does not want to hear them. That guy is very stupid. Corrective. Be cautious and be careful in considering the consequences. Replace shrewdness with concern. Use integrity, flexibility, open-mindedness. Fact-finding and time management. Ask questions. Get feedback from responsible people. Weigh the risks. Consider the impact of all the options on others. And I can tell you what, when you are really getting into this frame of mind that I am, and you see how many farms I can all dear to look at, and I look at this, and I look at that, and the water, and where is the next townships, there are so many different factors that I have to look at, that I have to look at one for one for one. Want wat help het, ek krij nou een lieflike plaas. En ek is omsingel die townships. En hulle besluit op een sekere dag. Nee, wat ons nou genoeg gehad van hierdie whiteies. Ons maak oorlog. En daar gaat ek. Jy verstaan? Oor die watertabelle sak. En daar kom een groot droogte. En hier sit ek op een plaas. En hier is nie een druppel water nie. Of daar is droogte. En ek kan nie lucerne van my dieren krij nie. Of. Dit is een centrum wat mense nie by wil wees nie, want dit is te laag nie of dit is te laag. Daar is een hele klomp faktore wat jy in acht moet neem. En wat jy hard aan moet werk. And that you got to give consideration to. In order to find the right thing. Now I got to weigh up the interest rate against the amount of money I can pay off. Against that I can claim back from VAT and tax. Daar is een klomp goed. But you don't just go for the place that looks like You don't just go for the place that looks like And you don't know the facts. So oftentimes I sit and I talk to people in the surrounding areas, even before I get to the farm, to find out what's really cooking in that area and what is going down. 
I go to the nearest town. Ek praat met mense daar. Ek praat met die estate agents. Ek niks met die saak te doen het nie. You got to ask questions. You don't just go for something that you think is right. You make sure you got the facts together before you go into it. Scriptural application. Wisdom. Wisdom is the anticipation of consequences. You look in all the night, they die word. Consequences. Galatians 6, 7 and 8 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man sows, that he also shall reap. For he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. So in my business dealings and in looking at, at, at potential sites for centers, I have to think beyond who I am and where I fit into the picture. I've got to see this thing in 20 years time, in 30 years time, in 50 years time. Maybe the raw tarries, maybe in 100 years time. So I've got to see where this thing will go to in the future. It's not just about who feel bokeh gana kan skiet and who like die veld nie. You understand? There's a lot of other things that I have to take into consideration. How is this going to impact upon our kids and how is this going to impact upon the next generation of people that have to take this place over after my kids? Because what am I sowing here? Kingdom. I've got to think kingdom. I haven't got a concert and think myself and my own little king. I've got to think and how will this impact upon the Lord and his work globally. So that takes a little bit more than just looking at what you see and what you think. You've got to hear what the Spirit is saying. That is the law of sowing and reaping. It is an ineffable law of nature. The farmer expects to reap more than he sows. Count the cost, Jesus said, for which of you attending to, intending to build a tower sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. Luke 14, 28 to 29. So what is the Lord saying to us? He says, listen guys, I've given you brains. Use them. Use them. Use the principles of financial wisdom. Use the principles of building people for the future. It's not just about profits. It's not just about performance. It's about people that have to be developed. Why? Because what is our business really? Making disciples. That's really our business. Thinking, this thinking error characterizes a person who is out of touch with reality. Life teaches that doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results is insanity. Like watching a bad football play on a video rerun and expecting different results. It always comes out the same. As hulle die game verloor het op television, gaan hulle die game verloor op die video. Klaar. Jy kan om replay soveel as jy wil, jy gaan die selwe result kry. You would think we would learn. When we do the same thing repeatedly, the results will be the same. Corrosion and cut off. A criminal may stop himself <coughs> sorry, from a criminal activity because of his conscience. <coughs> Some of them don't have a conscience. A sincere wish to change. Sentimental or religious thinking. Or fear of getting caught. He overcomes his inhibitions by the process of corrosion and cut off. Now these are the hardened guys. These are the guys that as they besluit het, they gaan het bank roof dan roof alom. Corrosion is a mental process in which he gradually drowns out his conscience by repeating and increasing thoughts of the crime until his desire to commit the crime outweighs the other thoughts that might have stopped him. And I mean, you see it so many times in some of these big bank robbery movies. Hier die ouwens beplant dit en dit en dan sien jy gewoonlik in die spannes daar ou wat begin dwarstrek en dan klap die ander om weer recht. Jy weet, en dan kom hulle uiteindelik by die punt waar hulle nou die bank gaan roof, en dan charge hulle daar aan, en hulle gryp sakke en sakke en sakke vol geld, en dan storm hulle buitenkant toe in die kar van die staat nie. Of jy kry hulle waar hulle uiteindelik by die motel injaag, waar hulle by mekaar sal kom, en dan gooi hulle ons die geld uit op so'n hoop op die bed, en dan duik hulle daar aan, en gooi hulle die geld, die boor hulle, en die meantime stap hier die ouwe by die vensel by, en die kyk hier die spult so, hy sien die gun staan aan die rond, en hy sien die hoop geld, oor bankrovers, bel die polisie, bam, 
Ze dus laten lopen hulle toe, terwijl hulle daar aan hulle geld speel en te keren gaan. They thought they got, away, they got away with it. They never got away with it. But in the process of getting that mula in their hands, they eliminate every little bit of conscience or anything that might just get in their way. Because the mula they want. The mula they get, but then the long life sentence as well. Cut off is a mental process that impedes the conscience quickly and completely. So, I snijd net die gedagtes af. He uses fragmentation to block out the conscience and shuts his entire focus off on the crime. He blocks out the memory of how bad he will feel later. Corrective. Experience self-disgust and use it as a tool to remind self of the consequence of crime. Recognize guilt and fear as useful tools to guide daily behavior. Inventory the results of past crimes and weigh long-term consequences. Do not allow self to dwell on or fantasize about the excitement of criminal acts. Scriptural application. To repeat a portion of scripture we looked at earlier, it is appropriate at this point. In the Amplified Bible, 1 John 3, 20-21 says, Whenever our hearts, in tormenting, self-accusation, makes us feel guilty and condemns us, for he is above and greater than our conscience, our hearts, and he knows, perceives, and understands everything, Nothing is hidden from him. And behold, if our conscience, our hearts, do not accuse us, if they do not make us feel guilty and condemn us, we have confidence and complete assurance and boldness before God. <coughs> so at the end of the day, see yourself standing before the Lord and giving an account of what you are about to go and do. Because that's what's going to happen. You can do what you like. What you're planning to do, good or bad, you're going to give an account of it before the Lord. You can do it, not what you will, pal. That end result is there. It's written in scripture and there's no getting away from it. So, before you're about to go and do something, just picture yourself standing before the throne of God and explaining to God everything that you're about to go and do. Because that's what's going to happen. And as a result, when your conscience accuses you then, ditch the story. Ditch it. Because it's going to happen the way you don't want it to happen in the end. So, what does this say? All these guys that get themselves into politically powerful positions, and that connive and organize murders and crimes and everything in the name of the state, and they seem to get away with it all their life, I feel sorry for those guys because you know what? They're going to stand before the Lord and terrible is going to be their judgment. Because they thought they got away with it, but they didn't. There's nobody that's going to get away with any kind of unrighteousness unless it is covered by the blood of Jesus and there is sincere repentance and a change of heart and mind. Facts. What we are considering here is a difference in the fact of guilt and the feeling of guilt. The fact of guilt exists when we violate God's word. The fact of a person's guilt or innocence exists whether that person feels guilt or not. A sociopath, personality, can commit murder without any guilt feeling. His feeling of no guilt has no bearing on the fact of his guilt. He still took someone else's life and for that he's going to pay. Whether he believes it or not, whether he feels guilty about it or not, he's going to pay. What you sow, you reap. Klar. Guilt comes in two varieties, authentic guilt and false guilt. This is what the 1 John passage is dealing with. Authentic guilt is spiritual conviction. It will drive us to God. False guilt is self-condemnation and will drive us away from God. Authentic guilt is rooted in the clear stated fact of the word of God and this feeling of guilt performs a valuable function in our lives. We do not do that which is forbidden because of the God-given Bible-taught conviction we have regarding it. False guilt will produce all sorts of problems. A self-defeating lifestyle, self-blaming, self-justification, self-shame or codependency, addiction, obsessive compulsive behavior and sin. When we carry the load of false guilt, we give Satan every opportunity to beat up on us a very good. 
He wants to immobilize us and paralyze us by making us feel unworthy of our vital relationship to Jesus Christ. One of his favorite tools is false guilt. Now look at verse 23 of 1 John 3. And we receive from him whatever we ask because we watchfully obey. There we go. His orders. Observe his suggestions and injunctions and follow his plan for us. And habitually practice what is pleasing to him. Living in the gap. This important verse follows right on the heels of the two about conscience. Right decision making is a result of knowing and following the divine viewpoint. I do what I do because God says it. I do what I do because I believe it. I do what I do because that settles it. Conviction. So, at the end of the day, in, search, in, in searching to further what God wants us to do, what is the end mindset that I have? I want to do what God wants us to do. I want to purchase the property that God has for us. And what is the result? My mind is constantly open to God's principles, to God's suggestions, and on top of that, I use all the facilities that God has given me to apply my mind to proper fact-finding and asking the right questions and seeking the right answers in the right environment, at the right time, at the right price. And when all of that comes together and my heart is at peace and my mind knows I have done everything possible that I can do from my point of view and I've left it up to the God Finally, that at the end result will be his purpose and plan. And then it will work. But I don't allow my own selfish desires and motives to get in the way. Look now at Matthew 6.33 which says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let me again repeat, if everything you want is what God wants you to have, God wants you to have everything you want. That's a wonderful place to be. That is really extreme freedom. Follow? Don't you afraid? Emotional impressions and other impulses can come to us from three sources. God, and that will have a result of joy, love, and compassion. He gives us strength to persevere in times of stress and trouble. Satan. In Ephesians 6 and 2 Corinthians 10, we are told that Satan hurls mental darts in an attempt to create emotional delusions and imaginations and obsessions, strongholds. He uses these against us to immobilize us with fear, anxiety, and depression. So if any one of those three things are present in my situation and dealing with people or in seeking the God's will, then I know somebody is busy planting some ideas in my mind. And then, of course, the third source, which is most of the time, our worst enemy is self. Jesus faced a terrible decision in the Garden of Gethsemane. Should he go to the cross or save himself? However, he did not listen to his inner emotions. He made a decision that contradicted his feelings. Not as I will, but as you will. Matthew 26, 39. He prayed to the Father. All of us face decisions in which we feel our emotions pulling us apart. That is when we must pray as Jesus did. Not my will, but thine be done. Many of you guys reach that crucial point in time in your life on a program around about the seventh and the eighth month. Now you really want to get out here and get on with your life. And this is where you need to pray this prayer. Not my will but thy will be done. Because what is the point? What is the point that you leave here and you're not quite sorted out and you go out there and guess what the enemy is going to do? He's going to focus on that area where you are not quite sorted out. And you know what? He's going to nail you. And once he's nailed you and there's fear and anxiety and depression in your life, guess what's the next step? You're going to start self-medicating. You're going to look for a way out of those negative emotions and feelings. 
and the thing that you know works instantly is a needle or a line or a puff or a pull on whatever. And I got you. And I said, Jenny, we'll get Where and where and where and where she never shall have So that is the time to pray. Not my will, but thy will be done. Stick with God's will by basing life-threatening decisions upon our emotions while deceiving ourselves into thinking we are being objective. We expose ourselves to a myriad of problems. 